Well, it's, uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here in, uh, in Paris. Uh, reminds me of when I, I lived here for a summer and all the great uh, French colleagues I've had in the field of cryptography and the like over many decades. It's uh, true that I developed a lot of uh, the notions of blockchain and electronic money and uh, message protection that I'll be speaking about already the very beginning of the 1980s. Um, but let's just sort of zoom out here for a minute and look at things from first principles and take a broader perspective. So I think most young people that I meet believe that the internet just sort of came with the planet and I'm going to ignore all of the questions about where that came from and how that uh, got in place and the unique business models and, and all the struggles and everything and the, the, the great significance of it. And let's just start with this second level here, which is where we are today. Most people kind of rushed into personal mobile. They were felt that it was a need to actually have a personal mobile device because all their friends did, because it was so useful and so essential. And there were many more uh, basic questions which were ignored in that, in that rush. Like what should it really ultimately be like? How should their personal interests be protected against those of society? How should countries be protected from other countries in the personal mobile world? But everyone had to have it. It was a need. And now, and this is the nature of the so-called Maslow hierarchy of needs, if you probably ran into this somewhere, it's the most popular notion of us from uh, psychology, I believe, that once a, the basic operation of, of the phones to uh, get messages across and keep track of data and do ride hailing and uh, uh, like that are met, then they no longer are regarded as needs, but the next level up suddenly is transformed, like in a phase change in physics, from being just a nice to have possibility to being a need. So what is now the need that the cons consumers all across the planet feel? You know, business is largely about needs, right? Meeting needs, remember that from, how many people went to business school? Yeah, well, I taught at a business school. That was one of the big things, right, needs? Well, what people now perceive as needs is protecting themselves in this new environment. The, the privacy of their data, the security of their interactions, and so forth, and we'll, we'll look into that. Um, so I maintain that at this critical juncture, that we find ourselves at now, there are really two different ways to go as far as meeting those needs. Very fundamentally different. There's no middle ground. There's no going back. We have to make a choice. It's irrevocable and, and will have a dramatic impact on almost all aspects of, of society and life. So. It's because when someone knows something about you, they know it, and they can use it against you, and you can't get it back. And even legal means are 
largely proven to be ineffective in such uh, situations. So let's try to understand this information a little more deeply, just a little more deeply, two kinds, regular old data like what the, you say, the exact words you say, okay, plain old data, and, you know, what your blood pressure was on a certain date or some kind of factoid like that. And you can, yes, encrypt such data and send it from one point to another. But it's really not very interesting, all that, when you compare it to the metadata, which is a word that the public has now come to appreciate and understand. This used to be the exclusive province of governments. They used to call it traffic analysis. And the secret was that there were no laws protecting traffic analysis data. In any country in the world, governments could see who was sending letters to who, who called whom, and so on. They could follow you around all day long, and that was completely legal. And they took great advantage of this. But now in an automated system, the public, with such pervasive use of information and significance, people are becoming aware of the importance of this metadata. And, and, there, and it was uh, given different names. So like our, our president, Ob Obama, called it metadata as a kind of euphemism. Also to blur it in with a lot of other things that have been called metadata. But spooks have always referred to it as traffic data, but in the social networking sphere, it's called the social graph. That is the main asset of Facebook, according to their executives' speeches, right? It's the who talks to who and when and for how long and from where. And this is something that doesn't lie. It's compact information that can be analyzed by very sophisticated techniques that were, in fact, developed by my country, by the Central Intelligence Agency of the United States. It's in the congressional record. They paid several universities to develop a whole theory of, of how you could find out about people by analyzing this kind of information. And then they put it to good use. They used it to take over a little country called Chile that had a democratically elected president who we didn't like. And so we took over the country with just a minimal amount of effort because we did traffic analysis on all government communication and we knew exactly how to take over the country. This is a matter of public record, the only CIA operation that was ever forced by Congress to be uh, interrogated by congressional testimony. So you can read about it in the congressional record as I did when I was a graduate student at Berkeley trying to understand the significance of metadata. So this man knows a lot about metadata. Up. Please, talk to us. Oh, come on. Can the audiovisual people make this video? We kill people based on metadata. The government has been perhaps unlawfully breaching the public's privacy in the name of national security. Spies from China have also penetrated the computers of America's largest business organization. Equifax is dealing with growing fallout. Major breaches in recent years at places like Target, Home Depot, and J.P. Morgan. How safe are your photos? Facebook may have mishandled data for more than 50 million users. And that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake. Yeah. And he's at it again, and he doesn't care. And recently, he wrote an article about privacy, and he had seen the light. And uh, in that article, once again, Mark told us that, well, the metadata, that was his information, and he was going to use it to protect us against spam. But for, as far as the end-to-end -end encrypted data content, 
why that was something that he was going to open a public debate about whether and to what extent the public should have a say in how it's accessed. But the metadata, that was off the table. Well, that did not fly very well, and almost all of the dozens of articles about his article pointed out that the public is no longer that naive as to, as to conflate end-to-end -end encryption of message content with complete protection of information. The public is now aware of the need for them to control their own metadata in order to protect their own interests in the informational world. And in fact, you know, the stakes are much higher. It's not just whether it will be business as usual with Facebook and the like. It's what about what's happening in China to certain regions, to certain people, uh, to the whole population? What about what China's trying to do to many other countries? Um, what about their fascination with artificial intelligence? What's it going to mean when artificial intelligence gets access to your metadata? Is, is the whole meaning of life the way Sundar Pichai has portrayed it over, over years, that Google's just going to make your life easier for you to live? That's it? That's what the 10,000-year struggle for uh, the creation of civilization is going to result in? Is that, is that what we want? Computers control? <laughs> okay. All right. So I've got the vests in the back, and if you want to get them out, we're going to march around the, uh, the incubator for a while to feel better. So it's a, this is a very serious, probably the biggest question of our time. Look at what is the most powerful mechanism that's come from people studying little, tiny physics, ex physics experiments. It's information technology. And it is going to shape our world irrevocably, dramatically. And this is the key question about it. And fortunately, the public has woken up. They don't want others to have control over their metadata. So what they want is a protected sphere. And I wrote about it already in the 80s. And it appeared in Scientific American, which I believe had a French version at that time, speak about digital imperialism. And it was uh, translated into French and some other publications as well, in German and many other languages. But there are really only two ways to go. There's no middle ground. There's no going back. We can't wait. It's happening. So very concretely, what is it that consumers actually want in terms of a product? Well. Face, I mean, uh, sorry, uh, WeChat has, has proven that. They are the dominant platform in China. They have payments integrated with messaging, and all the other giant messaging platforms that are regional, typically around the world, are trying to copy them. And that's because it's natural. And if you look at why Bill Gates pivoted his whole company and put his, all his best people on giving away Internet Explorer and trying to kill Netscape, it was because at that moment Netscape showed a browser which had the Windows desktop in it. In other words, Netscape was trying to get between the operating system and the user. And that is what WeChat has done. They are between the mobile phone platform and the user. They provide a space in which you can send and receive messages, make and receive payments, as well as interact with key applications, all within WeChat in China. It's not like that in other countries. And they are aggressively uh, growing in, in, in Southeast Asia. And so that's what people want. That's the real battle of the times, and in order to win that, 
we need a way to provide something that is acceptable to consumers and that allows countries to be protected from each other. So we need rapid transaction times for messaging and payments. We need not just the, con the secrecy of message content, but rather metadata protection. Okay, uh, that is both a vertical privacy of linking your IP address to your transactions and horizontal between your transactions, a figure of merit being the anonymity set. Current privacy payment systems are a rather uh, poor at, at, when looked at through this, this proper metric of anonymity set size. It's not really that interesting to be anonymous among half a dozen other drug dealers. We need a system that can scale to the global scale so that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, meet the success with, with uh, throughput. Not that hard to do, uh, in fact. And we need quantum resistant security. Someone like myself has worked in government and uh, high stakes industrial security can tell you that elliptic curves that are the basis for mo the security of most of your precious uh, cryptos are a joke compared to the, the capabilities of a national laboratory. And when they want to take these down, they will. And so we need quantum resistance if we want to have something that is of uh, enduring capability. And that, so we need these properties, these four properties, but they are enough to meet what consumers need and let me show you how they work. But she doesn't want anyone to know that the two of them are communicating. Message content can easily be protected by so-called end-to-end encryption. But this does not protect the information about who is talking to whom and when. The metadata, which is increasingly recognized as far more revealing and more challenging to protect. Each member of a team of nodes, in order to protect the metadata successively shuffles the batch of encrypted messages using its container of secretly arranged tubes and sending the messages without delay through to the next team member. Even just a single node can keep senders from being linked to recipients. Alice also gets a receipt informing her confidentially that her message was provided to Bob. Team members then destroy their secret pattern of tubes, making way for a new team ready for a new batch. Earlier, each node is chosen independently as a kind of random secret key, which input tube to connect to which output tube. Elixir's breakthrough over the type of messaging I open sourced in the 80s is a way that enables almost all the work to be done well in advance, yielding the only known way to provide real-time metadata protection smartphone to smartphone. Lead can also pay you me by sending what appears to be an ordinary message, but that actually contains numbers that serve like metal coins and paper money. A called such denominated unforgeable numbers digital cash, first issued by DigiCash in the 90s. Elixir's breakthrough improvement on the original digital cash now makes it fully distributed and quantum resistant. Elixir thus is able to uniquely provide a new ultimate metadata level protection of confidence confidentiality in all your online communications and payments for the first time giving you a protected sphere protecting your digital world today and your digital future. And we also need distributed applications that can keep secrets, can be easy for anyone to launch, that are inexpensive and can use the full power of current computing platforms and my company Elixir, uh, which has implemented those protocols I just showed you, also has developed an approach that allows dApps to run off-chain by uh, a kind of multi-sig interface and business logic, uh, which runs off-chain. So we're working with many uh, major players in developing countries who aren't happy with the 
good old-fashioned way where every European country had their own phone company and uh, there was a nice tight little monopoly where we uh, uh, then uh, rushed to the digital imperialism phase where those big companies in Calif Northern California could sort of take over the world as if they had invented some miracle. It was just holes left in the IETF spec for them, by them, that they filled. And so what, what is needed is a level playing field based on blockchain so we can have a world-class level uh, of security where there can be transparency uh, of business processes and two-sided business model so that models so that dApps can develop uh, in, in, in each country and consumers can have access to the services offered potentially by all countries so they can advance their own uh, economic and uh, other uh, aspects of their life. So uh, I'd like to uh, urge you to join the hundreds of people who volunteered to run nodes without the potential for profit in our beta uh, node project, which is the first really open, transparent process for uh, vetting uh, beta nodes. And, and thank you so much uh, for uh, supporting the blockchain. <laughs>